What's up guys, it's Colin for The Score Esports. My usual partners in crime when it comes to interviewing, podcasts, all that good stuff, Daniel Rosen and Josh Burry, decided they'd rather watch the World Cup than work. So here I am alone with my guest today. It is Ricky Mulholland. You know him better as just Ricky. How's it going guys? What's up, just Ricky? How's it going, man? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to The Score Esports. It's a pleasure to have you here, Thank you. Uh, especially since our offices are located in downtown Toronto. Not Australia or Las Vegas or LA or Copenhagen. So tell me, how long have you been in our fair city of Toronto? Um, I moved here probably a couple of months ago now. It's been, yeah, about two and a half months. I was previously looking at uh, apartments in, in North America, mm. but then um, I met a lovely girl here and I decided to move in and I noticed that Toronto is a good place. It has a good ping for Counter-Strike as well, so it, mm. worked out, it worked out perfect for me. Good ping, girlfriend, set. Yep, no problem. You're here. So yep. do you like the city so far? Uh, the city's beautiful. It, um, for me, it's top three in the whole world. The only, actually I made a tweet the other day about it, the only mm. city that I prefer here is my hometown, obviously Melbourne, because <laughs> it's, it's a biased thing, but in general, um, Toronto is awesome. Everything, everything that I've seen here, I absolutely love it. Well, in all fairness to you, Melbourne is an awesome town as well. Yep. So, but we're happy to have you here. We're really happy you could come in. Uh, I think this is your last day, correct me if I'm wrong, before you fly out to a boot camp with uh, the rest of Rogue. Yes, um, we set up the boot camp um, a couple of weeks ago uh, because I just recently joined the team. So they want to get something down where it's like a, a two week proper boot camp and get, um, get uh, so I can get to know the guys a little bit better, but also all the stuff that I need to, they need to introduce me uh, in their tactics and everything, just get it all done within the first couple of weeks. So mm. we're prepared nice and early. And is that gonna be in Las Vegas? Yes, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Rogue have set up a Airbnb for us. Um, beautiful, like seven bedroom, four bathroom house. We're all gonna be in the same house. And um, the benefit is as well, you're in Vegas. So you can have, when you're on your time off as well, you're boot camping, mm. it's all hard and, hard and good. And then after that, you can go and chill on the tables maybe, play a little bit, so. Yeah, how That's much uh, Counter-Strike are you actually going to be playing in Vegas? <laughs> uh, lots, actually. You'd be surprised. Um, we have, a, as, as of now, uh, actually our schedule got set. So we are probably starting, it looks something like we start at 11 o'clock. Mm. So it's wake up, we do two hours of dry runs and demos and stuff and just pre-game talk. And then we have three scrims, which they're, they're 30 round games. So they normally last for the hour. So we have three scrims and then a break, probably at around 4 p.m. and then another three scrims. So overall, I'd say it's around 11, 11 to 8, 11 to 8 or 9 o'clock. And then after that, we can, we can relax. Is there any eating involved in there? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one lunch break and that's it. That's all we're allowed. No, um, yeah, we, we'll, we, have a couple, we have a couple of breaks and we'll go to dinner with the team and stuff. And okay. So it should be fun. Oh, that's really cool. So yeah. this is your first boot camp with them, but you previously attended an event with the rest of Rogue and it was DreamHack Austin. You guys did pretty well placing second. Was that the first time ever meeting them as a team? Um, yeah, uh, a couple of their players I've spoken to before I joined, uh, Sick and Cadian. Mm. But as a team, yeah, this is the first time I've met them and gotten to know the guys. And yeah, that was my debut event, the first event I attended, Austin. So what was that like, just showing up to Austin and being like, hey team, let's go play a map? Um, yeah, so everything happened uh, really quickly because it was, originally it was all a mess because I didn't know what team I was joining. I was... Um, I'd been in North America for two months already and I didn't know what was going to happen because there were situations where uh, a team was going to happen and then the next day it wasn't going to happen and then it made me think, oh well, is anything actually going to happen with me? Am I just, am I just coming here to play FPL? So I was a little bit stressed out, but um, as, as you know, CS is a volatile environment and things are always changing and luckily for me, um, these guys had to make a change in their team and they decided to to trial me and things went well pretty much straight away. Yeah, I would say so. So you alluded to it just a moment ago there, but your previous team was CLG yep. and they ended up sort of dissolving the Counter-Strike division of, of their esports teams. Can you walk me through what happened there from your perspective? Yep. Okay, so do you mean uh, to the time where they decided to disband or from the beginning? Yeah, like I guess, I guess uh, where I want to start is sort of when did you become aware um, that that was going to happen or that it, that it might be a possibility down the road? Okay, so unfortunately, um, I don't want to make it sound bad from, 
from uh, from CLG, but they didn't let us know until probably the last couple of weeks. So it was, I think it was results based. So mm. I think it depended if we qualified for the, the North American minor to get to the major qualifier. If we passed that, they probably would have considered keeping the team. But um, there was some internal issues with um, not mainly me, but players and um, the organization in terms of salary and how much people think they're worth and things that CLG had promised players and that they didn't receive. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a business thing, like things, things happen, like they understand, but at the end of the day, they just came and said to us, look, um, we did say that we're gonna keep you guys, but now when Madison Square Garden um, came into the picture, they decided to like clean up the organization and put, every, put business first, basically, which is, I, I completely understand, so, but um, it, it didn't put us in the best situation, but that being said, I had a four month break, a four month paid break in Australia as well. So I had time to chill, relax and go back home and gather, gather everything and decide what I want to do again if I want to come back or not. So it's almost a nice silver lining. You, you, you don't want that to happen, of course, but if it's going to happen, you'd, you'd like to have a paid, uh, yeah, a exactly. paid break. So yeah. there, was ben there was benefits to it. So, so after that happened, you're, you're home, you're chilling out for a little bit, you're thinking about things. What was your decision? I imagine you sort of looked at it as, do I want to move to North America or Europe? Do I want to continue with Counter-Strike at all? What was that thought process like? Um, so originally I was going to, I didn't want to stay in Australia. That was okay. the, the main thing. I know for a fact, um, not only that it's more profitable in Europe and North America, but at the same time, you have a better opportunity um, in a chance with a more a team that has a, a team that has a chance to be more successful in these regions. So not only you get to play more competitions, you get more chances, but there's also better players. So it's, it was a bit of both for me. Obviously there's more money, but at the same time, all the players are better, you have more experience. And I already had a taste of that for the past year and a half playing in these teams. And I didn't want anything less than that. I didn't want to settle for anything less. So I felt like I, I really just wanted to get, be back into the pro league, get into the pro league teams and, and start from there again. Fair enough. So were you fielding offers from Australia or did you come here? Um, I had offers from Australia, but yeah. there was nothing really too serious because I think at that point um, I had already made tweets that I intend to come straight back to North America. Ah. And at that point I'd already, I'd already planned it. So um, yeah, so then I just, I just went with it. So did you come here before you had sort of signed on the dotted line for Rogue? Yeah, I hadn't signed for anybody. There was, it was all up in the air. So okay. the, the original plan was um, move in with my girlfriend in, in Toronto uh, and play FPL and just grind FPL until I find a team. Um, I, was, I was confident enough that eventually I would find a team, mm. whether it be a pro league team or a team in MDL or something. I was confident that I would be able to, to have a job in the, in the, in the pro team. Mm -hmm. But it was just a matter of time and waiting. Um, there were, as I said like before, there were certain teams and things that were going to happen and then the next day it would literally just be something different. So then it was a little bit stressful in those terms because these were, and these are like, these were tier one teams that I'm talking about as well. So I was very, very excited and very happy. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be in a really good team. And then the next day it changed. But then when Rogue approached me, um, I, I, these players as well, I see that they're, they're just as good as all, as Cloud9, Optic, and all, all the top teams in the North American region right now, we can definitely compete. So I was more than happy to, not only try and play with these guys and, and see how they play and everything and they were happy to have me, so it, it worked out good. So when you're talking about fielding offers from other teams, these tier one teams, how close did you get with the negotiations? Like how close were you to actually signing with these teams? Um, I'd say the closest I got was I was already talking to their CEOs and mm. we already had a contract ready to go and then literally just changed with the snap of a finger. Okay. So. Now when you say, uh, when you signed up with Rogue, you said they could compete with the cloud nines of the world, the team liquids of the world. What about that organization gave you that kind of confidence? Was it the specific players that were already on the roster or was it something more organizational, something about the, the structure or the CEO or, or, or whatever that gave you the impression that this is the team that I, I want to be a part of? Um, I think it's definitely a bit of both. I think the players have more than enough skill to be mm. able to pro progress in the rankings and um, together I think we could make top 10 or possibly even more. 
So there was that side as well, but then I did my research on the Rogue as an organization mm -hmm. and um, what they do for their players and all the stuff that they have behind them. Um, Steve Aoki obviously has a big part. He plays a big part in the team. Um, the streamers, uh, Dr. Lupo and all, all those cool guys. Um, so I looked at the organization as well and I said, these guys are pretty good. Um, it, looks, it looks all nice and fair and, and awesome. So um, other than that, yeah, I think, and yeah, just the, the players in general, I was very happy with the the general skill level as well, the players. Did you so, know the players as like individuals relatively well before you joined Rogue? Or were there some of them you're like, oh, I've, I've never even talked to this guy, I've never interacted with him? Um, only briefly spoken to two players. The other guys I, I barely even knew, but mm. um, I know that they have um, a bunch of significant achievements already and they, they are a, a group of experienced players. Mm. So I was, um, I was happy to be a part of that team because I would have, it's, it's hard because for me, I, I wouldn't play in a team that I'm not happy with, um, not, not to say the people, but it has to be a good team mentality and everybody has to be able to maintain a neutral like mentality towards each other. So it has to be a good team environment. So it's difficult to find teams like that. So I don't, I don't know, like I, I wouldn't play with a, with a team that I didn't get along with. Yeah. So it's always, it's always good to find people that you get along with and there's no issues or internal or anything like that, so it's good. I totally understand. You can have five good people in a room, but that doesn't make them good as a cohesive structure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, given what happened with CLG, did that sort of change your perspective at all in terms of the business of being a, a Counter-Strike player? Did that make you think, well, look, if it happened at CLG, this sort of like old story, mm -hmm. relatively solid esports brand, it could happen anywhere. Yep. Yeah. I just real I realized very quickly how volatile the environment is, mm. and I thought to myself, you know, well, it's it, it's very much results based. So it's more about it, it. It does sound selfish in sort of a way, but you do have to focus on yourself individually because um, there's a lot of teams that you can play for, and well, it, what what a better way to put it would be is you can play for a team, and a team whether they do good or bad is based on whether your org will continue to have you or not. So mm. there's always the aspect of, oh, I'm scared to lose the organization, I'm scared to lose my job and stuff. But at the same time, if you focus on your own individual performance and play well within the team and do your job, there is always sort of a safety net for, in, if, you, if you think that sort of way, you know what I mean? Like it's. I don't know if it sounds selfish or not. Do you think it's selfish to think like that, or I don't. I don't think so necessarily. I mean, I, you have the perspective that I don't, right? I've never been in your shoes, or I've been a pro player, or anything close mm. to that factor. But I think that that seems to me like a good mentality. Yeah, it's always good to look after yourself. Like you, you, you play in a team environment, but you you look after yourself at the same time. You I mean, no sure one else play. will, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Now, um, in terms of uh, CLG, before that you were on Renegades, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were benched before you left, and uh, before coming to CLG, I mean. Yes. Yeah. And on CLG, you made, if, if I may say so, quite an impact uh, on that team. I think your performance was quite good. Do you feel like when the org shut down their Counter-Strike division, that a little wind was taken out of your sails, or that some momentum was lost? Um, okay, so I can start, well, Basically from Renegades, when I was benched there, um, there was, uh, I can say there was definitely internal issues between, it was mainly me and uh, the coach. When mm. the coach joined, um, I, I can't really go into too much detail, but what happened was is both of us stepped out of line. I completely regret what I did and what I said, some of the things I said and did, mm. but at the same time, it was like a mutual agreement for me to pursue other teams and they helped me find other teams because the organization in general, they were just a bunch of great guys mm. and they understood the situation and they said, look, we're gonna help you find another team and we're gonna, everything's gonna be all sweet and everything's all sorted. So I was confident that I would be able to, so it was a blessing in disguise sort of thing. Um, it worked out both uh, best for both parties. Fair but, enough, um, yeah. yeah. So, and then the CLG thing happened and I think the most I think it was a great stepping stone in terms of just getting a lot of experience as not only as a main orpa, but um, I, I picked up the hybrid role and now I'm more confident like doing almost anything in the game. So it really helped me in terms of just moving up in experience. 
Right, so at the end of the day, it actually kind of worked out, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it worked out good. I want to ask you a little bit about Hiko. Um, yeah. You're obviously going to be playing, or you already have been, excuse me, playing with him uh, on Rogue, yeah. and he's a legend. Yeah. I mean, we do a lot of uh, historically based content here at the Score Esports, including highlight videos and, and storytelling. And the amount of Hiko clips that I have looked at in the last couple months is astounding. He's he's got a highlight reel this long. Were you intimidated at all, or excited, or how did you feel when you went? I'm going to be playing with Hiko. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I what I felt. Actually, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm playing with Hiko now. Like, you know, shit's shit's getting serious. It's all right. But um, I was. I wasn't intimidated, so mm -hmm. to speak, but I knew that he's already, he has a massive following. I think he has something like over 300,000 followers on Twitter and mm -hmm. he has a very, very big brand and he's like, he's already, he's made, he's made a grand final at a major. It, albeit it was two years ago, it doesn't matter. Like it's a major is a major, you know what I mean? So he's had a very long history and yeah, I'm actually honored to, to play with a player of that caliber and that, um, yeah. Are you hoping to, I know this is your, your first boot camp, so you haven't had that much experience with him in particular, but are you hoping to pick up anything from him or, or learn from him? As you said, he's got a lot of very high level experience. Yeah, um, definitely. He definitely has a lot of input in terms of when we're, when we're practicing and our strategy and stuff. So he's yeah, obviously probably the most experienced player in our team. And then um, I think, but in, in general, all the guys have a whole bunch of experience as well. So they work very well as a unit and they're open. Everybody's open to each other's opinion. Everybody's able to take um, constructive criticism and they work very well together. So Yeah, well, uh, Sick even has some recent major experience himself yeah. with Misfits Little Run. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty nice. Now you alluded to this a little a little while ago and your DreamHack Austin results uh, speak for themselves as well. But how are you feeling with this current roster in terms of performance? What do you think the limit is here? Um, I think it's very, very much possible to be able to break the top 10, especially with the amount of events that are going on. Um, in terms of winning events, I think it, that'll take time. Um, it takes more time than people think, especially with new teams. Mm. Unless your team is mechanically so unbelievably good, like take into account phase or players like that, they're all star players with 500,000 to a million dollar buyouts and huge contracts and very high paid players. So if you have, if you have players like that, then yes. But when we have, um, so going into the tier two and to the, the lower bottom of tier one mm -hmm. is you have to meld as a team and be together for a couple of months and make sure everything's set and in stone. And um, not to say that players are not mechanically as good, it's just getting those strats together and making sure that you have everything set and you're prepared. But also you have to have fun as well. If, you, if you're playing too serious, that's one of the things I noticed. If you, mm. if you wear yourself out and take it to a point where it's too serious and the game's not fun anymore, then your res results will show that you're not having fun anymore. Like um, some of the worst times in my career and the worst uh, have been the worst tournaments I've ever had is because of the way um, I felt in the team. It's, 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 it literally feels like it's 50% mentality and then the other 50% <laughs> is like preparation and playing, playing well, you know what I mean? Do you get the sense that Rogue as an organization understands that and is willing to a lot that amount of time to you and the team to grow together and, and become sort of the best you can be? Yeah, um, I think one of uh, Rogue's main focus is the CSGO team, so that's probably the best thing about it. And mm. as well, um, Rogue's one of the orgs that, so we all, we all play from home online, so mm -hmm. it's a more comfortable environment, but at the same time, um, it, 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 if you have a gaming house, so I've experienced both, both of them now, so I've been into a gaming house with Renegades for six, seven months and then I've done CLG for eight months and I've noticed um, it has to be the right five people and it has to be the right group of mentality to be able to make that work because mm. no matter who you live with, no matter what happens, you're going to have conflict with someone, right? Yeah. There's always going to be some sort of conflict, whether it involves you or whether it involves other people in the house, there's always going to be something. You can live with your best friend for six months, you're going to have an argument sooner or later, you know what I mean? So I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah um, so I've experienced both sides and the gaming house stuff works with people that want to do it. But when you get to, so I'm, I'm already 26. So I feel like I have, like, I'm not old, but in gaming terms, I'm getting older. You know, in esports sports the, terms, you're getting older. In esports, I'm yeah. getting older, right? Yeah. So um, some people, you know, they have girlfriends, they have families, they want to be at home. And 
I think it makes sense to be able to choose what you want to do unless it's so I, th I think it makes sense more for younger players like 16, 17, 18 year olds that are, that are getting brought up into the game like it's good to have, have, a, reg have a regime and, a, and a, some discipline and something set but mm -hmm. as you're getting older and you've already done all that stuff you don't need to like be babysat in a, in a gaming house you know that's, that's what I feel like I feel like it's very much it was very much babysitting and like everything was very very like it's very anal but at the same time it's, it's, it has to be done if you're in that sort of environment so yeah totally I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, myself I just turned 30 so I'm basically mummified in terms of esports <clears throat> and I can't imagine living in a gaming house yes, around this age mm. especially if you do have like you said responsibilities like a family mm -hmm. um, or any financial obligations or anything like that yep. so one thing that you alluded to earlier was sort of your day-to-day -day routine and I wanted to get more into that I wanted to get more into a what a typical day for Ricky is when he's at a team house or when he's not, when you're just playing online matches from the comfort of your own home. And also the journey as an up and coming player. Because a lot of the times in Counter-Strike media, we hear about some of the bigger names. We hear about the FaZe Clans, the SK Gamings. We see uh, Instagram posts of them, you know, getting BMWs and stuff like that. But I, I kind of want the perspective of someone who's not quite at that level just yet. Yeah. Um, so basically, okay, so I'll start from my Australian teams. Um, the only difference is if you're, if you're not in a professional or if you're in a semi-professional team in, a, in Australia, mm -hmm. the practice times are different. You practice from 6 p.m. to like 10 or 12 or something like that because that's where that region, that's the time that that region finds games mm -hmm. because everybody has jobs, <coughs> excuse me, everybody has jobs and everybody has things to do during the day. Um, if you're playing in a professional team in America, then or in, in Europe, obviously, um, then the schedules are more like a, a, a day job where you start a little bit later, but it's more so, say, like 11 a.m. to 7 or 8 p.m. So it's more more like a day-to-day -day thing. So the schedule for me was, at the beginning, it's after dinner, you start scrims in Australia, but once, yeah, once you join a pro professional team, it's pretty much all the same. Everybody has the same schedule. So in, in those terms, um, yeah, it's pretty much the same. Um, I think... The top 30, top 40 teams, maybe even deeper than that, they'd probably have a very similar schedule to, say, the top three teams in the world. It's just um, little bits and pieces and differences in, in teams that um, they do different, different things in general. But, yeah. That's fair, that's fair. Going back to your first days in Australia, even before Renegades, I mean, what was it like when you decided you know what, I would like to play Counter-Strike professionally. Or did you even make that decision? Um, so the, fir the first thing was uh, streaming, actually, huh. because I, I, I was always playing in, in semi-professional teams. My, so like my first national event in Australia, because I used to play 1.6, it was in 2008. Mm. So that's where I sort of said, okay, I'm going to try and attend every possible tournament because I saw people were going overseas and stuff. I never thought I could do it for a job until maybe like late 2014 where um, Australia started getting maybe one or two qualifiers a year to attend a MSI Beat It or a ESL Cologne or something like that. And then ever, ever since then, and I saw um, how the game and how the industry was progressing, I said to myself, you know, well, I'm, I might as well continue, I might as well persist and continue um, pursuing pursuing it because I love it and at the same time now it's you can do it as a living and then oh yeah so streaming came in 2000 well I got I got the internet available to stream in 2014 so mm. you could do it beforehand but in the in specific areas in Australia it's very very hard to stream because you, you, we just don't have the, the good internet yet so it's slowly being rolled out um, so I think Australia is like something like worse than top 100 countries in the world for internet so nobody can stream there, it's very, very difficult. But I, that's what I thought I was going to start off doing as more of a job, just in case I couldn't get into a pro team, just in case I couldn't get a salary and stuff like that. So streaming was the, the first thing in mind, but then it swapped around as, as time moved on. Okay, so going back to the early days, and actually even now, were there slash are there pro players that you sort of looked up to when you were coming up? Like, I want to, you watch him on stream all the time. I want to be like him. I want to be like nothing. Yeah, uh, definitely. In the, when CSGO first came out around, yeah, 2013, 2014, the biggest, well, the biggest teams, obviously, NIP, Fnatic, NVS, um, 
So NIP came from a mixture of 1.6 players and two source players, and then Envious uh, was the previous Very Games best source team in the world. So those players always looked up to, in terms of Australian players, there was even um, top Australian players that when I was growing up I looked up to as well. Um, uh, names that come into mind like Top Gun, Havoc, all the guys that were in the, all the guys in Vox and all, I, I knew one day I wanted to just be as good as that team, I wanted to travel and I wanted to do exactly what they're doing. So I looked up to all those guys in the beginning as well. And were there any NA players that you looked up to? NA players, yeah, definitely, like you said, uh, nothing as mm. well. So much experience, crazy talented player. Um, all the all the up and coming young NA players that came up, that, um, like Stewie2K, um, Automatic, uh, Tariq, those guys, um, Twists, uh, Naf, uh, Elige, uh, all those guys, insane raw skill and talent. So um, I wouldn't say I, I look up to them, but they're all people that I saw, um, they're all very good players in my eyes. What about uh, Shroud? Did you watch much of him? Um, no, be before uh, Shroud, um, he was Emmy, Emmy Clips, right? I remember watching him briefly, but I didn't know, um, I didn't really know what he was, what, what he was all about. But then um, I quickly realized like he was a big part of the community um, when uh, I noticed the when the whole streaming thing came to Australia. So how did you how did how do you mean a big part of the community? Um, he he had already established himself um, through streaming and stuff, and he was. Uh, one of the earliest members in Cloud9, so he was uh, very well known and um, he was uh, also, um, I don't actually know when he started, but yeah, he was he was there from the beginning. I know that for sure, mm. so. What do you feel like, uh, just, just sort of I'm harping on Shroud right now, but what would you say is his impact on Counter-Strike in general, but also the North American scene that you're now part of? Yeah. Um, I'd say uh, from an early stage, um, it just, it's very, very good. His, his marketability, not only for himself, but the game was it, was, it was good for the game in general. Like you need people like that um, to be able to show the, um, the possibilities and the things that you can do within the industry. Um, people like that, that are also not uh, like famous, famous streamers, so to speak, they bring a lot to a game and they bring a lot to a community. So I think it's very good. What do you think of his um, position in the community now that he's moved away from playing professionally and he's doing a lot of like PUBG streaming? Yeah, um, oh, now he's just chilling. So he, um, he seems to be having a good time streaming. He had, his, he had a very good run in CS and I think he loved playing the game, but then um, it's also, I think streaming is very important as well because not only is this, it sustains um, your marketability as a player and it can only get better, but it's also an important thing to do for, not only for your organization, but for yourself as well. Uh, he hasn't been out of the pro spotlight for that long, but I always like to ask when it comes to a player who's retired, do you think if they came back tomorrow that they would be competitive at the level that they were when they left? Uh, definitely. For example, nothing that just played in the ESL in... Uh, Belo Horizonte? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say it properly. Yeah, I'd say I say it like that as a Belo Horizonte. I'm yeah. sure I'm not saying it's it a, properly, yeah. so don't worry. It's a very interesting way to say it, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, nothing came back from almost, I think almost a year of inactivity now, and he managed to play decently well, and they made, a, they made the grand finals. So I think uh, retired players, they can come back, and if they have... I think you would have the same motivation as you did when you quit. If anything, probably more motivation because you haven't played for so long. I know for myself, if I take a month off Counter-Strike, I come back super, super keen and I'm like, oh, I, I just want to play, like hurry up, let's get it done, you know? Gotcha. So. For players like that, like what Nothing's doing now and, and, and what we might like to see from Shroud, do you think that NA sort of needs those guys? It seems like the region is in a weird place right now. You had Cloud9 won the major, came out of nowhere, incredible, great moment, we all loved it, and then kind of did nothing. Yeah, I think not only Cloud9, but everything is a mess right now. So there's been... Um, Cloud9 currently have four players. They, I, don't, I don't think they even know what they're doing. They're tri they said they're trialing MBK and Skadoodle doesn't know what he's doing. So um, it's all a mess there. Uh, I think the, the most consistent team right now is Liquid because they have a, they have a stable lineup. Um, they've been together for, for a while now, well, at least a couple of months with Taco. And everything else, everything else is up in the air. But not only, not only in North America, I think um, the European scene has changed a little bit as well. Um, 
I, it's it's hard to understand uh, the SK and the it's hard to understand the Brazilian players going to NA teams and they're swapping it around. I think they're just trying things at the moment, just to see if it would work. Um, I don't know if it if it's going to work for them. It, it seems like it is. So I think um, it's an interesting experiment. I think it's just a messy experiment. That's all. So it's it kind of seems like at least from one perspective, maybe we're entering this new era of international rosters, like truly yep. international rosters, uh, instead of just regional rosters. Do you think that this will continue to be the trend and we're going to see more uh, mixed language, mixed regional teams? Yeah. Or like you said, could the experiment potentially fail and we go back to, okay, well this is an all French lineup, this is an all Danish lineup? I think um, it's, it's, it's going to work both ways. I think it'll work a lot better if the, the teams already speak English, but if you're going to have a player that um, barely doesn't speak any English and joins a fully English speaking team, it's always going to take time. So it's a 50-50. That's why I think that it could, all, it could fail, but it could also succeed. But in terms of international rosters, I think um, yeah, a lot of teams are looking more to do that. As long as they keep, as long as you have your core three from your region, you can play in that region. So. And yeah, they're looking, looking to do a lot more international rosters, it looks like. Yeah, as you said, it's, it's kind of a crazy time right now. You've got so many formerly top tier rosters that seem to be struggling and swapping people out, like revolving door system. You got G2 yeah. is a perfect example of that. Um, even FaZe, not by design, but because of Olaf's absence, you know, they've had a couple yeah. of people in and out. And I mm. wonder who you, like from your perspective, is top tier at this exact moment. Now, as we're speaking, uh, we are less than 24 hours after FaZe uh, winning that aforementioned ESL event, so I'm sure they're on your list. But in this crazy, tumultuous shake-up time, who do you think is top tier right now? I'd say the most consistent three, even with stand-ins, you have to say Astralis is obviously number one at the moment, and they're probably gonna maintain that until FaZe get somebody back in that has that is going to stay with the team, or if until or until they get Olaf back. So I'd put I'd still put um, Astralis, FaZe, and Navi are the top three most consistent. Mm. I think every other team is is all up in the air. You can you can break the top ten now. Um, if you're if you're anywhere in the top thirty in these teams, you you have a chance to break the top ten now. It's very very mixed up at the moment. So I wouldn't say teams have gotten worse, but there's a lot of there's just a lot of um, mixing and matching at the moment and not every team is set, set in stone, so. In an environment like this where there is a lot of volatility and not a super clearly defined top, do you think that that benefits um, teams like Rogue who are maybe looking to climb the ladder, so to speak? Oh, most definitely. Um, I think, uh, so I can see our, our mentality going into it now is, um, oh, look, all these teams are making roster changes. It's all a mess at the moment. We have a better chance now because not only we're, we're up and coming, but it's just, I, I, I don't know, it, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it's easier, but it, it feels easier. It gives you the impression that it's, that it's easier. So you might as well just say it's easier. Like it feels, it feels better saying it's easier, so. Yeah, if you, if you come at it like with a better attitude, like we can do this, then it is, it is easier, yes. right? You feel better. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'll wind down this interview just by getting your thoughts and actually your hopes, your hopes and dreams for the future of this rogue roster. Where do you guys, or rather, where do you see the team going in the next month, six months, and if you're still together, a year from now? Yep. Um, so I can tell you, uh, so my contract with Rogue is for a year. Okay. Um, so within that whole year, I intend to do everything in my power to get us minimum into the top 10. And I think everybody in this team is super, super motivated. Um, from, from the time I joined to how we've been practicing now, um, it's a very, very happy, very good environment to play in. Everybody's comfortable at home. So I think, I, I would like to minimum get us into the top 10, whether that means win, winning tournaments. I think it's, it's more important to make playoffs and make semis and always get into deep runs because you don't have to win a tournament to break into the top 15, top 20. As long as you're consistent making semis and making playoffs, you'll always get into that sort of spot. And then as the experience and as, as you naturally get used to that sort of thing, then eventually you're gonna win a title. I think it just, it's just a matter of time for us. Stay in the mix and one, one title will yeah. be yours at least. Persistence is key. So just 
you know, just go with the flow, basically. Key, key to life and apparently to Counter-Strike as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Ricky, well, thank you so much for coming down. It's been a real pleasure talking with Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. If you want more great content just like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.